My name is Joe Peroni and this is the Rise Above Project. And today I want to talk about defending and countering the narcissist. Now again, I'm using the word narcissist here because it tends to like trigger the algorithms and I do want more people to see the show. So in this day and age, you have to use the word narcissism. But you can just as easily replace the word narcissist with a person who is antagonistic, they're challenging, they're somewhat competitive. Uh, we can use the word bully. They, people who tend to bully others, people who are very pushy, people who like to uh, break people's boundaries. There's a lot of that. You can get really good people in business who will also push you because they're trying to get to the bottom line, right? They're trying to make business. They're trying to, you know, put profits sometimes over people. So those types of people as well. So let's use all of that and not just the word narcissist. So when I think about this question about how to defend or counter against a narcissist, and how big of a question this is. And I don't know if it's a big question in psychology, to be honest with you. I think it's more about like the pseudoscience that you see on these YouTube channels. And they're everywhere, and it's actually taking over psychology. I mean, I think there's more people now, you know, ha having good businesses based upon the YouTube channels and, all, and making, I don't know, the, these uh, articles in like the Huffington Post more than there is legitimate therapist. Uh, why do I see it as not being that big of an issue? I mean, I understand it is, but I don't see it as rocket science here. So today is uh, the official beginning of football season. So let's look at it like this. If you are on offense, you're trying to protect your quarterback. What you're doing is you're trying to create a boundary, your front line, to protect your quarterback. So what if you do if the defense keeps running through your line and sacking your quarterback? Do you quit? Do you complain? Do you just try to make a new rule to say that they're not allowed to sack your quarterback and complain about the other team? No, that's not how the world works. It's not how life works. It's not how sports work. What you do is you create a better line. You create a better boundary for your people. You know, for another example, for people who don't like football, let's take wrestling. If you are in a wrestling match and some person keeps taking you down and throwing you down to the mat, or in boxing, somebody keeps punching you in the face, what do you do? You quit and you say, this person's not allowed to punch me anymore, they're terrible, or this person can't take me down? You don't do that. What you do is you develop your skill. You know, and if it's boxing, you learn how to duck, you learn how to bob, you learn how to weave, and you learn how to hit back. If it's wrestling, you learn how to sprawl. You, there's a million things you can do. But the one thing that you don't do is to complain about the other person. Why? Because you are not in control of that other person. So let's take a look at awareness. You know, if we want to talk about, you know, how to defend against the narcissist or a difficult person. We need to have awareness to know the rules of the game and who you're playing. So right off the top, accept the fact that they probably won't change. Now, I did a show recently about how they can change. Don't worry about it. Changing is on them. So you don't worry about that, so move on. So the next part is you have to take responsibility for yourself. What can you do to defend yourself better against people who like to break your boundaries? So you have to think about that. The other part that's really important and you see this over and over again, like narcissists are these super intelligent predator type of people that take advantage and they destroy people. No, they don't. First of all, narcissists are not top of the line type of predators, right? They're not that. They're not apex predators. They're not a lion or a lioness. They're nothing like that. You want me to prove it to you? First of all, in a lot of these YouTube channels, they like to pit the narcissist up against the super empath. Yeah, there's a lot of empathetic people out there. I'm one of them. But the true empath, the person who is, just, they, they feel everything to the ultimate degree, you're confusing hypervigilance of a person who's been traumatized. And I did a show on that, and maybe I'll, 
I, I'll, I'll post it again. But that's what people are experiencing. If you are that affected by other people and you have no defense against it, you're a traumatized person who hasn't figured it out yet how to defend yourself. You're probably not an empath. You know, empathy is a lot of things, but an empathetic person can still defend themselves against people who are trying to hurt or to harm them. So what are narcissists? They're codependents. So when you see these channels, when they pit the narcissist up against the codependent, the codependent empath, narcissists are codependents. Now, as we know, a narcissistic personality disorder, by definition, is a personality disorder. But you can also consider it a mood disorder. Why? Because they need external they need, they need admiration, right? So that's one. They need excessive admiration and compliments. Where do you get that? That's external. What else do they do to regulate their mood? They like to put people down. They like to hurt people. So if you, they can't extract the admiration from somebody, what they'll do is they try to devalue the other person. So that's two, two ways. Both ways for the narcissist in order to regulate their mood is external. They need other people. They're not people that can feel good by themselves. If you put a narcissist on a desert island, do they still cease to be a narcissist? That's a hard question because by definition, they would need other people. You can't feel grandiose or better than people if you're alone and you can't make other people feel bad to make yourself feel good when you're alone. So again, that means that they are codependent. Don't let anybody tell you anything different. They are not apex predators. In order to look for admiration or to look for a person who's willing to listen to them, make fun of them and put up with it, it's like a carrot on a stick. You can bring them anywhere they want because they, they don't stand alone. So no, they are not apex predators at all. They're very, oh, let's put it this way. Once you know who they are and what they are, they're extremely boring. They're extremely predictable and you can manipulate them easily. Again, why can you manipulate them easily? because everything they need in the world is outside of them. That's why, and that makes them weak. So let's talk about the most egregious things that narcissists do and how we can get around that or how we can defend or counter it. One of the things that they do is they try to devalue you to get an advantage over you. And how do they do that? They do it in a lot of different ways, right? They rage, they lie, they insult you, they antagonize you. They try to provoke you into drama. They provoke you into emotional instability. They try to make you do things that you would never do and say things that you would never say. They also love if you forego responsibility. What does that mean? It means that if they do entice you into an argument or entice you into not feeling good about yourself in that moment and getting just so disturbed emotionally that you can't go to work that day or you miss an appointment or you're talking to another friend and you don't speak to them the way you normally would and somebody could see that there's something wrong with you. They take a little uh, sadistic pleasure in that. So what, what's our move here? Well, number one, you have to create strong boundaries, all right? So if they choose to rage, you can remember this, if they choose to rage, then you need to choose to disengage because they're not actually trying to have a, a good conversation, a reciprocal conversation to actually get to a good uh, conclusion where you both agree on something or you agree to disagree. They're not trying to do that. They're trying to bring out an emotion in you. So what should you do? Leave. That's what you do because if it's unproductive. So you create a boundary and you say it, throw the fastball right down the middle. 
Say, you know, if you choose to treat me in this manner, if you choose to talk to me in that way, if you choose to do these types of things, then I will do A, B, C, or D. State it right out. Listen, don't, let's not act like there are these children, too, that we need to be afraid of. Give them every reason to grow up, right? If you enable them all the time and you just kind of go with the program and be a people pleaser, all you're doing is enable, enabling them to do the same thing over and over and over. And then it's on you. So if you make a, a strong boundary, throw the fastball down the middle, tell them what you're willing to put up with and what you're not, and what you're going to do if they choose to continue to treat you poorly, ball's in their court. Then they can choose to grow up or not. But at least you know now where they, where they stand. And you'll have to do that. So you could say, you know, it's, you'll either grow emotionally or maybe you'll just have to go. It's one or the other. But you can't stand there and take an emotional beating all the time. The other thing you want to do is to always maintain your emotional stability. Whatever that is. Because they enjoy if you get too angry or too sad. So here's an example, right? Like, so I know that um, you use this example for yourself in any which way you see. But I was raised in a way that I was told never to, especially around women, don't curse, don't be disrespectful. And that's a hard thing to live up to because everybody curses these days. So if I'm in a situation with somebody and all I have to do is curse once or twice, and they already know that I'm being emotionally charged. So what I'm saying is whatever you do, listen, if you curse every other word, then curse every other word when you're in a disagreement with somebody too. But you wanna maintain who you are at all times. Because if they see a change in you, they know that they're getting under your skin. So if you tend to speak slowly in a measured response all the time, then speak to them in this tone. If you speak a little bit quicker and you move your hands a little bit more, then, then do that. But try not to show your anger because then they win because that's what they're trying to do. They're not trying to make points necessarily. They're trying to get under your skin. They're trying to create an emotional reaction. So what's the other part to this? Why do people get so worked up? You know, and here's another part that's really hard for me to understand. How can a narcissist make you feel bad? You know, I think that's a great question because I think most of the time you feel bad because of your own deficiencies. That's the way it is. Listen, if you know who you are as a person, right, and you live up to that, and you know who you are, you know what you want to do in your life, you have meaning and purpose in your life, and you've set your goal to be, be that, and you have values and virtues, and you do your best to live up to that, to be your best self, who cares what somebody else thinks, right? Somebody can look at me right now and go, Joe, your haircut, I don't like it. You know what? I do. It makes no difference to me. It's impossible to insult me, literally. It wouldn't matter to me. You know, people complain too about narcissists gaslighting people. What does that mean? It means it makes another person question their reality. How can another person question your reality when you like who you are and you know who you are and what you want? Somebody could say, Joe, listen, I hate your purple mohawk. That doesn't question, I don't question my reality. I know I don't have a purple mohawk. Move on, next. You know, I don't care. What if they said I don't like your purple shirt? Mostly, no, only girls wear purple. Okay. It doesn't matter, I like the shirt, that's why I bought it. Like there's nothing a person could possibly say to get underneath my skin, I just don't understand that. Uh, I think Eleanor Roosevelt had this comment, but my, I, I wanna say my mother said it because she would say it all the time, is that nobody can hurt you without your permission, right? Like if somebody gives you a, a negativity, they say, I don't like the way you look, I don't like the way you did this, Return to sender. I don't need it, and why would anybody take that on themselves? It's amazing, you know, it's like, it really is a way, I think, because I like narcissists when they do that, because to me, it, it, it's like a stress thing. 
What it is, it's a barbell, right? So it creates more strength in you. So if you want to test your emotional strength and your emotional stability, hang out with a narcissist a little bit and allow them to speak. Because if they say something and it gets under your skin, that's a you problem, right? Because the only way you can actually be hurt by a narcissist when they say something bad to you is that if you agree with it a little bit. Like if somebody said back to the my shirt, they said, listen, I don't like purple. It looks terrible on you. And why would a man wear purple? And I thought, oh, it's the only shirt I had in my closet. Uh, you're right. I didn't want to wear it. So that would be right. So it would get under my skin because I'm actually agreeing with them. So what's the antidote? The antidote is to know who you are, what you want, live up to your virtues and values and have a self-esteem and have self-confidence. You know, again, worry about yourself. Stop worrying about everybody else all the time, right? Like if I drive a Hyundai and someone goes, oh my God, you should be driving a Corvette. It's like, oh yeah, I guess I should. <laughs> you go drive one. I had one. Like it makes no difference to me. I don't understand why people just are like that. It's, uh, I just don't understand. As a matter of fact, uh, let's talk about, you know, the lying part again with the, with gaslighting. How can anybody gaslight you when you know your reality? You know, you have to be a really confused person, in a sense, to agree with somebody else's vision, right? One of the things that Nietzsche said a long time ago, again, the greatest uh, philosopher who ever lived, he said, you know, I don't, I don't get hurt that you lie to me, because that makes you a liar. What I get hurt about is that I really can't trust you, you know, and that you're, the fact that you're trying to hurt me is bothersome. And I would agree with that, again, because it says a lot more about them than it ever will about you. So again, let's just put that away because I, I just, um, again, th the antidote is a high self-esteem. So what else do they do? And what else can we defend against? Well, they have a, an excessive need for admiration and compliments. But let's take a look at that for a second. Don't we all? I mean, here we can have a little bit of empathy for a narcissistic person or a difficult person, right? Because they're, they're looking for admiration, appreciation, compliments. Now, psychology is a very soft science, right? So it's hard to tell what's excessive and what's not. Like if you talk to somebody today, let's say you're married and your spouse says to you, oh my God, you look so good today. So you get one compliment. And then they compliment you, say two more times. Is three excessive or is that just right? Or is it not enough? I don't know, it depends on the person, right? So who's to say what's excessive and what's not? Mark Twain is arguably the greatest writer who's ever lived. And he said, I can do without food for two months, but I can't go two minutes without a good compliment. Is he a narcissist that's a terrible, sadistic person? A, who has no self-esteem? No, he's a human being, you know? Like, I've got uh, three dogs. Listen, w when do they not want to hear good boy or good girl or be petted? Every time I walk past them, they wag their tail. Listen, if humans were being honest, they would say that they would want more compliments. They would want, you know, more affection, more of everything. Yes, give me more, of course. You know, w w what's an amount of affection that's too much? What's an amount of compliments that's too much? Oh, I've had, no, don't, don't hand me another compliment because that'll make me a narcissist because I like it. It's garbage, okay? So let's just say that. But now that we know that narcissists are generally human in that area, that they want a lot of affection and admiration, appreciation, and compliments, how can we weaponize that if that was your thing? And here I can tell you, this is easy. It's like taking candy from a baby. I have had so many uh, experiences in my life because I've run my own business for like 35 years. And as a personal trainer, let me give you some examples here. If I want to try to run my business out of somebody else's gym, I don't just walk in there and go, can I work here? <laughs> you know, don't you appreciate me and my clientele? I don't do that. You know, I would walk in and say, you know, this is a really amazing place you put together. You know, it really, um, I can see your personality in, in every area of this gym, uh, the, the intricacy in which you, you took the time to pick out this equipment and that equipment and the color coordination. You know, it's amazing. You know, 
what is wrong with giving a compliment to somebody? Now, if you're in business, I'm not going to say that they're all narcissists, but they definitely are very proud of what they built. What you need to do is lead off with a compliment. Think about everybody in your life and think about what is the best possible compliment you can give that person. You know, and like my mother said a long time ago about, and I think everybody said it back then, they said flattery gets you everywhere. So how do you defend or counter the narcissist? Again, excessive need for admiration, how hard is it to do that? Especially if you do admire something that they do. And if you don't admire something, find something, right? Especially if you need them for something. And if the narcissist in your life is your mother or your father or your spouse, come on. You can't tell them you can't find one good thing to compliment them on. That's ridiculous. You know, I know you can. Another thing about a narcissist too, again, they're not top of the line apex predators. They have a lot of weaknesses in them and they're not as powerful as you think. It's like the wizard, it's like the old man, you know, behind the curtain in the Wizard of Oz. You know, once you pull down all that, they're a person that has a lot of weaknesses and a lot of insecurities. That's why they try to do, they put you down a lot because they do have this strong external critic. But here's something you might not know. They also have a very strong internal critic, but the internal critic inside them has like this big wall of cement around it with an electric fence, with a moat, with alligators in it. They don't want that thing to come out. So what they do is they use all of their critical being on other people. But you can beat them too in another way that most people don't talk about. And I will talk about that right now. Narcissists love people who are powerful and competent. Let me tell you about being a personal trainer. I've trained people like Howard Stern, Madonna, uh, John Kennedy Jr., you name it. Some of these people, uh, you know, and, and the like, they're not narcissists necessarily. They're just successful people. But they do expect certain things, right? And they can push boundaries, right? Because they expect to get good service for their money. What do you think can move them? It's easy. Competence. I don't care how much money so-and-so makes and how famous so-and-so so is and how great they are at what they do. But when it comes to, say, bodybuilding and they want to change their body for a certain reason and I'm more competent than they are, all of that haughtiness, all of that self-aggrandizing, all of that I'm better than you goes right out the window. So that's how you can beat a narcissist too. I mean, it could be anything, right? You could have the most narcissistic person in the world that owns, I don't know, a Lamborghini. That's fine. But when that Lamborghini is broken down and not going anywhere, trust me, they will bow down to the mechanic who fixes it. And if they don't know how to fix a flat tire, they will bow down to the person who is changing their tire. You know, I don't think people understand this. They want to be the most competent person in the room. And when they're not the most competent person in the room and they have no way to challenge that person, they fall in line. They fall in line. They're not apex predators. Get that, get that out of your mind. So how do you stand up for yourself? I'm gonna to try to keep this short. It's already 23 minutes, so I'm already going longer than I should. But I'll give you another example of something that uh, maybe no one's, that you have not heard of before. So I'm gonna use some of my experience here to tell you this. It's very, very difficult for a lot of people, right, to stand up for yourself. It, it, it's been hard for me to do that. Back in the day, like my first couple of years of personal training, I would open up my, my book and I would allow other people to write the times in that they wanted to train with me because I was afraid to tell them no at certain times because I thought I would lose business. I thought I would be they would be angry with me. I wanted to be a people pleaser because I wanted to make money. After a while, uh, what I started to do was my first little part of being able to make a boundary. Let's say at five o'clock, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I wanted to do something else. 
So I put in five o'clock and I would put the words in K-A-R-A. And somebody would say, oh, that's my time slot. I want to train at that time. And I would say, no, this person, Kara, has that time. Now, I didn't have the guts to tell them I didn't want to train this person at that time. I just put those letters in. And they're like, well, yeah, Kara must be a good client for you. And, you know, of course you would not want to train because, you know, you have to justify not training, of course, right? Like, because everybody wants money. So again, I would be stuck in a situation where I would justify why I wanted to take off here and there, which is you should never justify yourself to anybody. Make your decision and move on. But see, what I did was the word Kara, I left off the letters T and E. Because really what I was doing at that time, Monday, Wednesday, Friday at five o'clock, I would go to karate practice down the street. <laughs> so that was like my mini way of starting to defend myself. And even that wasn't that great, but I've gotten better at it over the years. So I'm telling you from experience. So if I felt, if you felt like I was being, you know, too overboard and saying it should be easy, I'm not saying it's easy. It took me a long time to defend myself and to be able to stand up for myself and not have to justify myself, especially to people who are really pushy. How can you do something in your life that might be a transferable skill to be able to defend in yourself? This is one that I thought of. Sometimes you defend other people and under other things very strongly, but are afraid to defend yourself. Something in your past made it that you were afraid, right? You had to you know, be more humble you know, and you had to walk around with humility and you didn't want to put yourself out there and you didn't want to say, okay, this is the way it's going to be. But you could do it for other people and other things. You know, I remember having a bunch of friends back in the 80s and everybody always liked these hair bands, right? Oh God, uh, Cinderella, the Poison, uh, Kiss was with the makeup and all these guys had these really long hair and they wore all this makeup and lipstick and they look, all look like girls. And they all played these songs with three chords and they had like no, no depth to their music. And I basically hated most of the 80s, but I kind of went through it. There's a couple of bands I liked, don't get me wrong. But I was always a fan of The Who, right? Because they did things at such an incredible depth. And most of my closest friends didn't like them at all. But I was always, I would always defend the who to the death. Now, what does that mean for you? And what does it mean for me? It means that if I could stand in there in the 80s when hair bands were the thing, where somehow it was masculine for a bunch of guys to walk around in spandex, give me a break, you know, I was running the other race. I was running the other race because I was able to really stand up for what I believed and what I liked. Um, I did stand up for myself most of the time. You know, I did work out at a gym by myself, whereas everybody else, they didn't do that. That was a solo project. So I did do things on my own. But when it came to music too, I was so able to stand up for the things that I liked and the who and my guys, my band, my team that it became a transferable skill as I got older. Because if I could stand up for somebody else, why couldn't I turn that and stand up for myself? And you can do that too. So a quick little rundown here. How do you defend and counter the narcissist? First of all, they're not that tough. They're, they're not at all. They're not apex predators. Forget it, throw that out the window. Number two, what other people say, what they say to you and what their opinions are, it's none of your business. You, they, sh they should never get under your skin. That should never hurt you. So there's all this stuff they go, oh my God, narcissists devalue me. No, you don't. If you believe what they say, you're devaluing yourself. They devalue, devalue them by saying it. Because it takes a really bad, poor, uh, unevolved type of person to look somebody in the eye and try to put them down to hurt them. You know, that's real low class stuff. So what they say is a reflection on them, not you. In terms of wanting admiration and appreciation and compliments, listen, we all want that. And if you know that there's a narcissist in your life, throw them a compliment. And if you, don't, if you want them to go away, don't compliment them. Don't feed the narcissist. Listen, I got a feral cat in the other room. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of taking control of that, right? Because I started to feed him. 
Well, if I didn't want a feral cat around in the first place, I wouldn't have fed him and he would have went to another house where he got some food, right? So it's the same thing here. Don't feed the narcissist. What does the narcissist need? They need compliments, appreciation, a lot of it. So don't give them any. They'll run away. Trust me on that. So I hope you liked today's show. Hope it was valuable to you. Again, with the 30-minute shows. Anyway, so if you're still here for this, thank you. So um, subscribe. Help me out. Uh, put a like on it. Leave a comment. I'll see you next week. Thank you.